The 1960s was an undeniable golden era of science fiction on TV. You had Star Trek, which redefined the way we look at interstellar exploration. Then you had the Twilight Zone, which pushed the envelope of what our imaginations were capable of conjuring up, oftentimes in quite the unsettling way. But let's not forget the Outer Limits, which might have taken a couple of the same cues as both of the previously mentioned shows, but stood on its own two feet, with impeccable writing, packed full of mind-bending mysteries, unsettling monsters, and hardcore science fiction. The Outer Limits was a weekly one-hour anthology series that ran for just two seasons, Yet it featured the work of some of the industry's top cinematographers, special effects masters of their craft, and actors of the day. Whereas The Twilight Zone could be whimsical and comedic at times, The Outer Limits was intensely serious and was capable of sending a chill up the spine of the most hardened of viewers. Unfortunately, the series was cut short after only two measly seasons, despite the fact that the show had a devoted fan base and its influence is still felt over a half a century later. Why did The Outer Limits get the axe so prematurely? Well, we're going to get to that in a minute, but first, we're going to take a look at some absolutely fascinating, fun facts about the series that still keeps us on the edge of our seats when we watch late-night reruns. And you're going to be blown away when you learn why James Cameron and Orion Pictures were sued by The Outer Limits' Harlan Ellison for plagiarism for a certain film we bet you've seen dozens of times. Stay tuned for that little factoid. But first... The Outer Limits was originally titled Please Stand By. Network executives were concerned that the title would prompt audiences to mistake the opening credit sequence as an emergency broadcast interruption of service. Remembering how the War of the Worlds radio broadcast in 1938 sent so many listeners into a panicked frenzy, thinking that the planet was being invaded by little green men, they decided to swap out the name and intro, which included images of test patterns typically used for emergency announcements. The show premiered at the height of the Cold War, after all, in a time where Americans were already on edge over the fear of a nuclear attack. The scripts were written by award-winning actors. What's a great show without a great writer? The Outer Limits had an amazing lineup of legendary creative minds on deck for scripting purposes. Robert Town, for example, was an Oscar Award winner for the film Chinatown. He wrote The Chameleon, which is highly regarded as one of the finest episodes in the Outer Limits series. Harlan Ellison, a master of the genre, contributed several groundbreaking scripts as well. And Joseph Stefano, the series producer, wrote more episodes than anyone else. Before working on The Outer Limits, he wrote the screenplay for Psycho for his good friend Alfred Hitchcock. An episode was censored for being too terrifying. In the episode The Architects of Fear, a monstrous beast proved to be so frightening to test audiences, ABC felt the need to censor the episode by covering the Thetan creature with a blank black screen. In some markets, the footage was pushed back to a time slot after the 11 p.m. news to make sure that younger audiences didn't wet themselves when they laid eyes on the behemoth. Of course, to today's standards, it wouldn't even raise an eyebrow. But back then, it struck fear in the minds of viewers who weren't as desensitized as we are. The series employed one of the industry's leading cinematographers. Conrad Hall was named one of the top 10 cinematographers in history by the members of the International Cinematographers Guild. Some of his work included shooting Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and American Beauty, both films he won Oscars for, in case you were wondering. He also utilized his creative cinematic vision for 15 episodes of The Outer Limits, including that Architects of Fear episode we just talked about. Monsters were recycled for Star Trek. After The Outer Limits wrapped up in 1965, many cast and crew members moved on to work on Star Trek. That includes some of the amazing monsters as well. In the series finale, The Probe, a giant microbe beast rattled viewers before it went on to become the Horda in the Star Trek episode The Devil in the Dark. In Star Trek's pilot episode, several other Outer Limits vermin can be seen in cages as well. Additionally, the pointy ears makeup effect employed in the Outer Limits episode The Sixth Finger would later be put to great use creating the signature aesthetic of the Vulcan race in Star Trek. Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner both appeared on The Outer Limits. Not too long before Spock and Kirk became television fixtures on Star Trek, the two actors appeared on episodes of The Outer Limits. Leonard Nimoy acted in the episode I, Robots, and William Shatner lent his likeness to Cold Hands, Warm Hearts. 
James Doohan, a.k.a. Scotty, also appeared in the episode Expanding Human. The Terminator was effectively sued for plagiarism. Tell me if this doesn't sound super familiar to you. A soldier from a dystopian future world, a grim era where men are machines that are born to inflict death, is sent through the sands of time and gets jettisoned onto a city street during an electrical storm. Following him into the past is a villainous foe, another savage killer from the same future time period he came from. Some 20-odd years later, The Terminator premiered in theaters and Harlan Ellison filed a lawsuit against Orion Pictures. James Cameron, director of the first Terminator film, was forced to admit that the film borrowed from the Outer Limits episode and was ordered to pay Ellison a large cash award as well as adding him to the movie's credits. If you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel and stay with us to find out why The Outer Limits was canceled so prematurely. The monsters were called The Bear by production members. The production team used a lot of exclusively unique jargon when talking about the show. For example, the creatures, giants, freaks, and aliens were referred to as The Bear. Most episodes follow the pattern of some sinister bear posing a significant threat to the protagonists. This antagonistic evil other motif really is what differentiated The Outer Limits from The Twilight Zone, which focused less on spooks, Martians, and villains, and instead honed in on supernatural phenomena that tinged with poignant social commentary. Episodes were filmed at intriguing locations. A modernist-style house on the San Fernando Valley side of the Hollywood Hills in L.A., called The Chemisphere, located at 7776 Torreson Drive, just in case you wanted to pull it up on Google Earth, was used in countless sci-fi films and TV shows back in the day due to the fact that it greatly resembles a classic conceptualization of a UFO. The unique octagonal design was once applauded as the most modern home built in the world by the Encyclopedia Britannica. The domicile was featured in the 1964 Outer Limits episode, The Duplicate Man. The home was also featured in the 1984 film, Body Double, and inspired a house in the 2000 Charlie's Angels film. The Simpsons also made reference to the iconic house in 1996, and most recently it appeared in the 2015 Disney film, Tomorrowland, in the end credits. A 1990s reboot ran for seven seasons. Taking note of the fact that the original series did quite well in syndication after its cancellation, Showtime chose to revive the franchise in 1995. This incarnation proved to be more fruitful than its short-lived predecessor. The series aired until 2002, first appearing on the pay cable channel before making the move to Sci-Fi, which was called the Sci-Fi Channel at the time. Leonard Nimoy made an appearance in this series as well as in the remake of the episode he appeared in the original series titled iRobots. There was an Outer Limits theme park ride. The Outer Limits Flight of Fear opened in 1996 at what was then known as Paramount's Kings Island and Kings Dominion Amusement Parks in Cincinnati, Ohio and Richmond, Virginia, respectively. The attraction takes the rider through an Area 51-inspired secretive military hangar before entering a large mock-up of a UFO where they're launched at great speed through the dimly lit hangar lit with strobe lights and imagery inspired by the classic television series. Paramount's licensing of the show expired in 2001, so all references to the show have since been removed, but the ride is still in operation at both theme parks to this day. The network made the terrible decision to move the show to a different time slot. The series was a huge hit for young, educated audiences in its first season. This was the same demographic that latched on to Star Trek as well and secured its place in sci-fi history. When ABC moved the series to Saturday evening as the lead-in to The Lawrence Welk Show, they had completely dropped the ball in terms of recognizing their target audience. Jackie Gleason and his American Scene magazine absolutely obliterated the outer limits in the ratings. Younger people tend to go out on Saturday evenings. They weren't going to stay home to watch the show, regardless of how good it was. The Outer Limits was subsequently canceled after its second season. ABC should have rescheduled the show to a better time slot. Judging by the fact that the show became a cult classic following its cancellation, it's certain they could have squeezed out at least one more season if they played their cards correctly. But oh well, at least Showtime did what they did back in the 90s. Fans of The Outer Limits may still have something to look forward to in the future. 
In 2014, it was rumored that an Outer Limits film was in development based upon the episode Demon with a Glass Hand, and in 2019, Variety magazine reported a new reboot of the series was in the works for a premium cable network. But between the original series and the 90s reboot, which was your favorite? Let us know what you think in the comments section. And if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to give us a like and subscribe to our channel. Tap the bell icon to turn on notifications so you can keep up with all our latest video releases as well.